Shooting anamorphic. What does it mean? When do you use it? And how do you film with it? Well, get comfy in that chair, bed, or toilet seat, and let's find out. If you're a filmmaker or cinema geek, then you've probably heard the term anamorphic be thrown around, but have no idea what it is and gently nod as you listen to your pretentious filmmaker buddies talk about it. As you may know, in the early ages of film, many films were shot in a 4 by 3 ratio. However, in the 50s, movie theaters started having trouble attracting more audiences to theaters due to the growing popularity of television. People didn't see any point in going outside the comfort of their own home, only to watch something you can later watch on TV. So movie theaters tried to find gimmicks to encourage more people to visit the cinema. This is when early 3D films, colored films, midnight spook shows, and widescreen films were released in hopes to lure more audiences in a theater seats. At first, they started by cropping the top and bottom of films to give the illusion that you're looking at a wider image, but this resulted in a good chunk of the image being lost. Their solution was to somehow make films stick out from the regular television program. This led to the creation of Panavision, Vistavision, and the first of its kind, Cinemascope. An optical company called Baj & Lohm created a prototype called the Anamorphosis Lens. It was originally called Anamorphosis because the word anamorphosis basically meant changing one axis of the image to create a wider, more distorted image that mimicked how our eyes naturally see more horizontally than vertically. This was later changed to anamorphic for obvious reasons. This inventor by the name of Henry Cretien essentially added anamorphic lenses to the tank's periscopes so that soldiers could get a wider view outside. Then in 1952, 20th Century Fox bought the rights from Cretien to create Cinemascope. Now these lenses were made to use that entire 35mm sensor that the cameras had, but compress the image horizontally by two while still using the same height as the frame. This led to a much wider aspect ratio of 2.66 to 1. However, since theaters needed to combine the film along with its audio, they added magnetic stripes to combine the two, but reduced the image down to 2.55 to 1. After filming some test footage, 20th Century Fox had their 1953 film, The Robe, be shot in anamorphic, making it the first film ever shot in Cinemascope as their poster clearly advertised. This led to movie theaters going with an advertising campaign that focused on the idea that the film will feel more realistic than 4x3 films, since the wider frame mimicked the view of the human eye. Of course, there were competitors going after 20th Century Fox, trying to hone in on this wider image trend. This is when all the other scopes and visions came to play, most importantly Panavision, which was a direct competitor with Cinemascope. They started off manufacturing anamorphic lens adapters for regular movie projectors so they could show Cinemascope films, but later started manufacturing their own anamorphic lenses, which was a big technical improvement compared to Cinemascope. So much so that by 1958, all of the MGM films that claimed to be shot in Cinemascope were actually being shot in Panavision. By 1967, Cinemascope was obsolete and Panavision became the way to go. So you might be wondering, what exactly did Panavision improve on that made Cinemascope basically go obsolete? Well, this might get a bit confusing, but just stick with me. Whenever you filmed with Cinemascope, the lenses squeezed the image down so that it could film on the regular 35mm negative. This caused the very skinny image like this to be produced. When being projected, they would use a reverse anamorphic lens which would stretch the image out to its proper ratio. Now, other times, instead of using the reverse anamorphic lens, they would stretch out the 35mm negative in the lab and basically convert it to a larger 70mm print that would be projected with a regular 70mm lens. Then Panavision came in around two years later and basically told Cinemascope, Hey Cinemascoop, you're outdated and too difficult to work with. I still love you. At first, they created projection lenses that had a prism that projectionists could use to play any anamorphic format in the theaters with the simple turn of a knob. This made it possible for more places to offer widescreen films without breaking the bank. Panavision later created some micro Panatar lenses, which in a nutshell made it super easy for anamorphic films to be converted in a non-anamorphic prints. Being on a roll, Panavision created a few ways to achieve the widescreen image without the pain of filming on Cinemascope. Regular Panavision used a 2.35 to 1 anamorphic lens that would automatically squeeze onto the 35mm negative. They then created Super Panavision 70mm. This would shoot in a 65mm sensor and when paired with the right lens, would produce a 1.25 anamorphic squeeze that would be able to get a high quality image in any format they wanted, whether it was in 3 to 1 Cinerama or flat 16mm. There was also Ultra Panavision 70. The difference between the Ultra 
and the Super Panavision is that the Ultra Panavision 70 used actual anamorphic lenses that distort the image. Some of the most iconic films in history that were made with anamorphic lenses on the Ultra Panavision 70 were Ben-Hur, The Hateful Eight, and my personal favorite, It's a Mad 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 World. Now the Super Panavision 70 would use regular spherical lenses to create the 2.20 to 1 aspect ratio. Movies like Lawrence of Arabia, 2001 A Space Odyssey, and Close Encounters of the Third Kind were filmed with this method. A little bit of extra knowledge, the size of the film that was used in the camera is actually 65 millimeter. So why do so many people call it 70 millimeter? Well, the reason for that is because once the film got processed, a five millimeter sound strip would be added so theaters would receive the final 70 millimeter wide film. Now, throughout the years, there have been so many different names and types of anamorphic lenses, but they all essentially do the same thing, give you that wider image. The unfortunate thing is that while you're getting a beautiful image and nice distortion, shooting anamorphic is a lot more inconvenient. They're significantly bigger and heavier than regular lenses, which makes it a lot more difficult to move around, especially if you're trying to get a tracking shot. They also have two focus rings, so this makes the first assistant camera's job a lot more difficult when they're pulling focus, since you basically have to focus twice. The reason for this is because one of the rings is at a vertical focal length, while the other one is at a horizontal focal length. To make it simpler, imagine you're using two prime lenses at the same time, so you need to set your focus for both of them to get the sharpest image. So using anamorphic is a trade-off. You get a more vintage, cinematic feel to it, but it'll also require more than a regular spherical lens. Plus not to mention the fact that these lenses are crazy expensive. If you want to shoot an anamorphic now, expect to pay at least a couple of thousand for a set. And if you're wanting to buy higher end lenses, then just forget about that sports car you dreamed of buying because you're paying at least 50k for for one 35 millimeter lens. Kidneys are overrated. So when should you use anamorphic lenses? Well, there's no real answer to this because it completely depends on your vision for the story. The best I can do is give my personal opinion of when I would and wouldn't use it. Personally, I feel like most straight up comedies won't fit this look. Can you imagine watching something like Dumb and Dumber or Scary Movie in an anamorphic aspect ratio? Not really, and there's a few different reasons that I can think of why off the top of my head. The first one is the sense of being right there with the characters. Since these lenses give off a frame that's closer to what a human eye can actually see, it has a subtle feeling to the audience that they're right there in this world that you've created. Second is the distortion. There are many factors to consider like how the lens is interpreting color, chromatic aberration, all the types of flaring you'll be getting, and basic distortions you get sometimes. Some lenses have it more than others, but if I'm trying to give a feeling that something is off, or if I'm making a dark psychological film, then I may be more inclined to use anamorphic lenses that are a little more heavy on distortion to give that vibe that something dark and twisted is going on. Lastly, there's just this style to it that I love. I'm not gonna lie, I truly can't pinpoint it, but there's something about the image that I'm addicted to. If I want to go for a more classic retro tone, I personally think that the anamorphic look achieves that the best. However, with all that said, it's completely subjective. There are dark psychological films like The Lighthouse that aren't an anamorphic. In fact, The Lighthouse nearly has a square frame, but it works so well for that story because you're supposed to feel trapped with these characters on this remote island. I can see this being shot in anamorphic and still work as a movie, but it probably wouldn't have given me the same unnerving tone or sucked me in into this world as much as it did, which kind of sounds weird after thinking about I shouldn't have said it like that. There's all types of films shot in all types of formats, so even though I feel like a goofball comedy like Dumb and Dumber wouldn't fit in an anamorphic ratio, someone else may see it and that's completely fine. I recently watched This Is The End, a raunchy goofball comedy that was shot in anamorphic. Since this was supposed to parody those epic end of the world films, then it actually really worked for me and kind of made everything a bit funnier because of how dramatic everything looked. So when should you use anamorphic? Use it whenever you want. There's no right or wrong answer and people will have their opinions, but at the end of the day, it's just personal preference. It's up to the director to decide what they feel is most appropriate for the story and what will make the most impact on the audience. For me, it's honestly just a gut feeling whether or not I wanna shoot in anamorphic and that's okay. So you've decided that you wanna shoot your next film in anamorphic, but now you're wondering, how do I do it? What do I need and how should I get started? Well, not long ago, it was very difficult to shoot in anamorphic because the only way you can do so would be through renting some expensive lenses or buying some cheap 
cheap ones on eBay that would have a lot of issues. We live in a great time for filmmakers because the anamorphic look is becoming more and more affordable every year. Personally, in the four times I've shot anamorphic, I've used an adapter. I can't afford to rent out real anamorphic lenses, so I simply rented out the Lettuce Direct anamorphics and put that over my normal spherical lens, then de squeeze the image in my editing software of choice. For filmmakers who are wanting to get started with anamorphic and are on a budget, I highly recommend starting off by renting these adapters. It's a great way to get a feel of what you're getting yourself into, and obviously there are some drawbacks, but you'll find that with any lens. There's always a give and take with those, so it's just a matter of doing your own research to see what you think will benefit you the most. After that, you can buy some vintage lenses or start renting them from equipment rental stores. If you want to learn more about which anamorphic lenses to buy, I recommend checking out Tito Ferradans. I'm so sorry if I butchered that name, but he has a huge blog and a bunch of helpful YouTube videos on the subject. My point is that shooting anamorphic can be pretty cheap or very expensive. In this day and age, there are so many tools out there for filmmakers, so it's all a matter of what you're looking for and what you can afford. Or if you want to just save some money but want to use every pixel, then just squeeze the footage down. See? I don't look that bad, right?